power. As humans, we have the power to do anything, go anywhere, be anyone, or so we think. Who are the true power holders in society? Who can you trust? Can you trust the authorities, your friends? Can you trust society? If everyone you've ever met thought you murdered someone, does that make you guilty? In wrongfully convicted cases, various factors contribute to the wrongful conviction of the defendant. This is an explanation of how Henry McCollum and Leon Brown ended up incarcerated for a crime they did not commit. Fall 1983, 19-year-old Henry McCollum moved back to Robinson County, North Carolina to live with his mother and 15-year-old brother, Leon Brown. Three weeks, 21 days, 504 hours, 30,240 minutes. It seems like a lot of time when you put it in perspective, unless those minutes are counting down to the day you become a murderer. That same fall, three weeks after Henry moved home, 11-year-old Sabrina Buey was raped and murdered. Justice. Police are meant to protect society and prevent atrocities like this from ever occurring. And when they do occur, it is their job to bring whoever has blood on their hands to justice. A lot of pressure is put on the police from society, especially when the crime is a murder and the age of the victim is quite young. This undoubtedly contributed to how the police handled this investigation. Target Practices Target practices of the police are a leading factor contributing to wrongful convictions. A police officer discovered that Henry McCollum might be a potential perpetrator based on a rumor they heard from a high school student. There was speculation that Henry appeared to be suspicious because he wasn't like the other kids at school. He was different and sometimes it's easier for society to blame the weird kid rather than the poster child. This is because clarity creates comfort. It makes sense that an outcast would commit a crime, and so they are often the leading suspects in a crime investigation. A single rumor turned into a wrongful conviction, all because someone with power was under pressure and chose to believe it. In the evening, Police showed up at Henry's mother's house, and Henry willingly went with them to the station, where he would be interrogated late into the night. Tell us everything you know about the crime. Where were you at the time? Who was there? We want to help you. We want what is best for you. We are the police. You can trust us. If you tell us what you know, we will let you go home. Did this interrogation cause anxiety to build up inside you? Henry and Leon faced an investigation similar to what you have just experienced, except theirs went on for hours into the night and they were not intellectually capable of comprehending the circumstances they were in. I am going to assume you as a watcher have an average IQ. The average IQ of a person is between a score of 85 and 115. Bullying tactics such as these utilized by the police indefinitely would pressure the average citizen. Henry McCollum had an IQ of 51 and Leon Brown an IQ of 49. These intellectual disabilities left Henry McCollum and Leon Brown extremely vulnerable to coercion not only this, but the two were black. Race is always at play in these types of cases. Tactics such as racial profiling are a leading cause of convictions every year. With the combination of race and intellectual disability, these boys never stood a chance. After four and a half hours of being interrogated, Henry confessed to the crime. 
a confession, something that is nearly impossible to retract once it has been said. Now, you might be wondering, what did he confess to? How did the police get Henry to tell a story that was not his to tell? Henry replicated the picture the police painted for him in his confession, and he signed the written up confession that he had just given, even though he could barely understand it. After unknowingly signing 30 years of his life away, Henry asked the police, can I go home now? Where does his little brother Leon fit into all of this? Henry claimed Leon had been with him at the time of the crime. Leon was then brought into questioning, coerced in a similar way that Henry was, and he signed his confession. Tunnel Vision Not only did the police coerce the young men into confessing, but they also fabricated evidence, all while ignoring any proof of their innocence. In their false confession, the boys mentioned two other individuals to be present at the crime. These two other potential suspects were never investigated. Death Do you believe in capital punishment? Do we as humans have the right to decide who lives and who dies? Is an eye for an eye justice? When Henry McCollum and Leon Brown were convicted by a jury in 1984, they were sentenced to death. Leon Brown was 16 years old, the youngest person in North Carolina to ever be convicted of the death penalty. A person being executed for a crime they committed is already a hard pill to swallow but a person being executed for a crime they are not guilty of. How does one stomach that? The two tried to take their confessions back, but once you confess to a murder, who is going to believe you when you say you didn't do it? In 1991, Leon was re-sentenced to life in prison, but Henry remained on death row, all because of a coerced confession. There was no hard evidence convicting the two brothers, nothing tangible to prove their guilt, just one man's word against another. Aside from the police, another trustworthy power holder is a judge. Judicial malpractice played a part in worsening Henry's case. Justice Antonin Scalia, a Supreme Court judge, claimed Henry was an example of why capital punishment should be supported. Henry's face was even shown on campaign materials during the 2010 North Carolina legislative elections, portrayed as a menace to society that deserved to be executed. Societal pressure to convict is always present, but when there are judges and politicians adding fuel to the fire, it is almost impossible to convince anyone of the truth. We know the police coerced Henry and Leon into confessing. But what the NC Innocence Commission uncovered is the greatest act of police misconduct present in this case, suppression of evidence. At the time of the murder, investigators were fully aware that the fingerprints found at the scene did not match the fingerprints of Henry and Leon. Not only this, but shortly after Sabrina was murdered, another similar rape and murder occurred by the hands of Roscoe Artis, a man who was previously accused of various sexual assaults. Roscoe Artis lived beside the grounds where Sabrina was murdered, and he was not once investigated for Sabrina's murder. DNA. A form of evidence that is almost key in all exonerations because without it, it is a matter of he said, she said. After uncovering Roscoe Artis and his potential connection to the crime, DNA testing was conducted on items found next to Sabrina's deceased body at the time of the murder. 
DNA was found on a single cigarette butt, but it wasn't Henry's or Leon's DNA. It was Roscoe who was a perfect match. This evidence was Henry and Leon's saving grace. They were released from prison in 2014 and exonerated in 2015. That same year, another Supreme Court judge, Stephen Breyer, cited the brothers' case as a reason to withdraw capital punishment. In 42 this morning, Henry McCollum regained his freedom. How do you feel, sir? I feel wonderful. I want to thank God. And shortly after, an emotional reunion with family. How you doing? First up for Henry McCollum, learning to live in a new world. Family car prepared to leave for home today. There was one more lesson, how to use a seat belt. And then you pull it down like that and clip it into the belt buckle there. Pressure from society. The age of the victim. Race. Intellectual disabilities. Target practices of the police. Suppression of evidence. Judicial malpractice. Police bullying. And media bias. All played a role in the wrongful conviction of Henry McCollum and Leon Brown. Because of the system's failure to prevent these factors from prevailing, Henry McCollum continues to try and rebuild the life he lost, and Leon Brown resides in an institution due to the trauma he faced during his time in prison. Where is the justice? These two men are logistically free, but in actuality, will they ever experience true freedom again? I will end with where we started. Power. If this case is any indication of who holds power, it most definitely is not me or you because at the end of the day, if the world turns their back on you, there is nothing you can do, nowhere you can go, and nothing you can be without the help of someone else. So if everyone you've ever met thought you murdered someone, how are you going to be anything but guilty? Well, I can't um, really describe it, right? But um, it feel good, it feel good after 30, 30 years in prison for something we didn't do or nothing. It's a blessing to be free. And I thank, I thank God for that. What you want to do now? Well, me, right now, I want to go home. I want to get in the tub. I want to think, eat, eat some food. And then I want to lay down. And then when I wake up the next day, I want to see this real. I want to, you know, just uh, pinch myself.